Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Neil. I'm one of the pastors here. I was going to introduce the pastor, but I've already done it. Pastor J.D.'s off today. He's taking a much-needed rest before we break into the Easter season. And I just want you to know, guys, it's the honor of my life to be here this morning. I love this church. I love everything that we stand for. I love being a part of everything that happens. And you know what I love most of all is getting to know you guys. It's really been the honor of my life to, to get to know some of you, to look in the eye and to shake your hands and come alongside you on this journey today. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about being on a journey because we've been in a series called Move Anyway. This is week three of Move Anyway. And when Pastor J.D. said, hey, we're going to call the series Move Anyway, I had a flashback to my childhood because my dad was a sergeant for a period of time in his life, and he used to come into the bedroom in the, morning, in the morning. I'd be laying in bed. You know how a guy like me would be. I'd be like, oh. He'd say, move. And I'd say, I don't feel like moving. He'd say, move anyway. He was the original motivational speaker. He was Tony Robbins before Tony Robbins. He'd get you up and get you moving. And that's what I want to do today. I want to keep you moving. Because we've been in this series about moving anyway. We've been on this journey. We've been talking about moving through some broken places. And we've been talking about how miracles follow motion. And we've been talking about driving through doubt and how doubt is a donation. And we've been talking about how God is a motion-sensitive God. How when we move, he moves. And that's what I want to do today. I just want to keep you moving. I'm like that lemur in Madagascar. I like to move it, move it. Two reasons I like to move it. Number one, I can't sit still. You know what my nickname was in high school? 55 mile an hour Neil. People said I was like a beat of water going around on a hot griddle. You ever see those videos of the dog going, that was me growing up. And my wife's not like that. So anytime there's a video of like a dog just kind of standing there and another dog going crazy, people will send the dog and say, that's you and Holly. And I'm always the little dog that's running crazy. But I like to move. I don't like to sit still. And I don't think it's my, my job as one of your pastors just to move you emotionally. I think it's my job to help move you. I think it's my job to help take you on a journey. And we're on a, a, a series that's camped out in a book about some people on a journey. It's really one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's the book of Exodus. It's about the Israelites being led out of Egypt on a journey through the wilderness and to the promised land. And, you know, as I, I talk about this journey, I have to say Moses, one of the central characters, is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And one of the reasons he's one of my favorite characters is because, well, he's a reluctant leader. And I think some of us can relate to the idea of, does, of not thinking that we're the guy. We're reluctant. We may feel that God's calling us to something, but there's probably never been a day in my life where I thought, yep, I'm the guy. I'm the guy. There's probably been no time in my life, in any walk of my life, that I thought, yep, I'm the guy. I'm it. I'm it. I'm always the guy that's kind of like Moses. You tell me I'm the guy, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to think about it, but I'll go anyway. I'm going to move anyway. And Moses is not pristine. He's got a little bit of a past. At one point, when he's about 40 years old, his temper gets the best of him, and he sees an Egyptian slave driver mistreating a Hebrew slave, and he picks up a rock, and he bashes him in the head, and he kills him, and he's forced into exile. And so for 40 years, he's living in exile. And the other thing I'm pretty certain about Moses, if he walked in here today, if he sat down next to you, you'd never say, yep, that's five-star recruit right there. Yep, that's CEO right there. I mean, Moses at this point, you know, he's in exile. He's a little disheveled. You've seen the movie. I mean, he left the Pharaoh's family to join the Hebrews again. They live in like kings in the palace. Moses is all disheveled. You watch the miniseries with Moses. He even got a big scar on his knee. His cloak, his big old scar and dirty sandals. Moses is not living the good life. He's tending to his father-in-law's flock. He's, he's out there day in and day out. And during that season, you know what happens? God speaks to him. God speaks to him in the form of a burning bush. He says, Moses, Moses, come here. I want to call you. I want to call you to go and invite my people, the Israelites, to leave Egypt and come to the promised land. And I want to point something out. At this point in the story, you know how old Moses is? 80. 80. So for those of you who are here this morning like me and you majored in time and space and your dad's money and you got a theater degree or an English degree and after that you got some other kind of degree and your life kind of went by and you lingered a little too long in your parents' basement practicing the guitar because you were going to be a songwriter and moved out at the ripe old age of 28. There's hope for you. There's hope. There's hope. 
Moses was 80 when God said, come on, Moses, get it going. At this point, Moses is a little grizzled, a little hardened. He's seen a little bit of life, but he says, you sure I'm the guy? I think the first thing he was thinking is, I'm 80 years old. But he said, you're the guy. And Moses is obedient, and he goes. And he goes, and he goes to Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. And those of you who know the story know that this journey is fraught with many pitfalls. This is not an easy journey. The story doesn't start off for Moses and the Israelites very well. You know, I've thought of something. You know, I used to be a songwriter, and I really believe that Exodus is probably the greatest inspiration for a country album ever written. Because you could title the album Ten Plagues and a Whole Lot of Heartache. I'm telling you, it's got a ring to it. It's got kind of an outlaw ring. You could kind of do a Willie and Waylon thing. The first single could be called Hard Hearted Pharaoh. Waylon could sing the first part. He's a hard-hearted Pharaoh in love with his Israelite slaves. Then Willie would come in, and he's got some pyramids he wants to build, and he don't want God's kids to get away. Come on, let's sing it. Y'all laugh, but I'm telling you, there's potential there. I've had a few cuts. I'm telling you, I think I could get that up to the charts about number 300. (laughs) Hard-hearted Pharaoh. It's got a ring to it. But if you know the story and where we pick up in the theme verse, we're picking up where God has hardened Pharaoh's heart again. And he's not happy, even though that he's resolved that he's going to let them go after some terrible tragedy. And he is hunting them down right now. He has hundreds and thousands of his best troops. It's like a Mad Max moment. Those of you who have seen the movie, you know the miniseries. Those Egyptians, they're bad looking. They got the eye shadow. They got their head shaved. They got the hair growing out of the side of their heads, and they're coming across the desert. And I know they're on horses, and I know they've got little chariots, but I see Mad Max. <laughs> Here they come. Ah! And the Israelites are going crazy. And that's where we'll pick up the theme verse. As we pick it up, Exodus 14.10, and don't tell me the Bible is boring. The Israelites were totally afraid. They cried out in terror to God. They told Moses, Weren't the cemeteries large enough in Egypt so that you had to take us out here in the wilderness to die? What have you done to us, taking us out of Egypt? Back in Egypt, didn't we tell you this would happen? Didn't we tell you, leave us alone here in Egypt? We're better off as slaves in Egypt. There's just corpses in the wilderness. And Moses says, don't be afraid. Stand firm and watch God do his work for salvation for you today. Take a good look at the Egyptians today, for you're never going to see them again. And then he assures them, God will fight the battle for you. God will fight the battle for you. And you, Moses turns into my dad here. He says, you keep your mouth shut. And then God says to Moses, why cry out to me? Speak to the Israelites. Order them to get moving. Everybody say moving. Hold your staff high. And stretch your hand out over the sea. Split the sea. The Israelites will walk through the sea on dry ground. And if you've read your Bible, or you've seen the movie, or you know the miniseries, Moses walks out to the edge of the mighty Red Sea because it's in the way of safe passage for the Israelites. On their way to the promised land is the Red Sea. Now, God could have taken them a different direction, but that's not the way God works. He didn't want to take them through Philistine because he was afraid they'd get in a war and it would discourage them. I don't know about you, a Red Sea in the way of me and thousands of Egyptians coming to whoop me is a little discouraging. But Moses hits the water, and God miraculously parts the Red Sea, parts it, and the Israelites walk through. They walk through safely to dry ground. And then the Egyptians, well, God bogs them down. God bogs them down as they're crossing and the wheels fall off their chariots and they're stuck in the mud and God closes the sea up and they're gone and they're gone. And the Israelites stand on the other side safely looking back at the miracle that God has done. And if you're anything like me this morning, you go, well, it's a pretty good story. I like that story. Good story. It was a good movie. Love the Charlton Heston version. My dad loved it. The special effects are cheesy, but it was a bonding moment for us. We loved it. I got to stay up late when it was on. But if you're anything like me, you know what you're saying? Man, this is 2018. This is 2018. And I really don't know what a bunch of Egyptians chasing after some Israelites in 1451 B.C. has to do with me this morning. I don't know where it, I don't know where it applies. 
I was telling my dad what I was going to talk about. He said, man, it's 2018, Neil. You got more computing power on that phone in your pocket than what put the man on the moon. You got to update things. I'm going to update it for you. Because, no, we might not be being chased this morning by Egyptians in 1451 B.C., but you and I know what it's like to be trapped between our version of Egypt and our version of the promised land. And we know what it's like to be chased by something. We know what it's like to be caught in the middle. And we might not be all the way there. We might not be to everything that God has for us. But I want to point something out to you this morning. You know where we are? Here. We are here. What do I mean by here? We're in God's house. We're in God's house. What did Jesus say? Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. What did David say? Psalm 122. He said, I was glad when I got to go to the house of the Lord. Why was he glad? Because he knew God was there. And I'm telling you, you are here and God is here. And I believe God is going to move through your life. Maybe you were like me during worship. You were overwhelmed. You felt tears in your eyes. I wasn't crying because I'm sad. I was crying because I knew I was in the presence of Almighty God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am, the everlasting Father, the ancient of days, the true vine of Israel. I felt God's presence, and I was moved. And you are here, and I am here. And there's another part of us being here. You know what else we have by being here? We have each other. Not only do we have God's presence, we have God's people. You see this happening in here this morning? This is God's plan for us. Hey, I'm not saying God don't move on the outside of church, but it's God's plan for us to assemble. It's God's plan for us to do life together. You read the book of Acts. They met in the temple courts by day and the homes by night. They were there, and they had each other, and they did life together. But I want to ask you a question this morning. You ever wonder about the people who aren't here? You ever wonder about the people who aren't here? Do you ever wonder where they are? Because I do. I do. And I have a theory where they are. Now, I want to say this. We're here. Okay? I really want to impress this upon you. I don't care if you came in here a brand new believer. I don't care if you came in here on the fence about this whole God thing. I don't care if you came in here like my grandmother would say. You've been around church so long, you knew God when he was a little boy. Heck, you played kickball with Moses. I don't care. You were here. You're here. But they're not. They're not here. So ask yourself, where are they? I'll tell you where I think they are. They're in a place that we came out of. Now, we might not be all the way there yet, but we're going somewhere. We're on our way. They haven't even left yet. You know where they are? Egypt. Egypt. And I don't mean the country of Egypt. I mean Egypt. I mean their own personal version of Egypt, their own version of Egypt. They're in Egypt. And Egypt comes in all different shapes and sizes. And you know about Egypt. And I know about Egypt. And you know why? Because everyone has an Egypt. Everyone has an Egypt. You know what I always say? Egypts are like elbows. Everybody's got one. Some people got two. Some people got three, but I don't have three elbows. But everyone's got one. Everyone has an Egypt. And Egypt starts off for some people really bad, and it gets worse. And for some people, I want you to see this, for some people, Egypt starts off like it is for the Israelites. You know how it started off for the Israelites? It started off great. Look at this in Exodus 1.6. It says, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all the generations died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. They were killing it in Egypt. They were rocking it. But then... A new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. He'd never seen Prince of Egypt. He came to power. And he said, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. 
Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies. They'll fight against us and leave the country. So they put the slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And over time, Egypt went from a really good place to be to a really bad place to be. And over the course of time, the Israelites went from free people prospering, thriving, to people who were oppressed and in slavery. You know how long they were slaves? 431 years. That's a long time to be a slave, 431 years. Those kind of numbers will blow up Ancestry.com. Server just go poof. You know why? Because that means your daddy's daddy, daddy's 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 daddy's. You keep going so on, so on, so on. Century, century, four centuries. No, nothing except what the Bible said was bitter, hard bondage and oppression. Bitter, hard bondage and oppression. And you and I, when we were in Egypt, before we made our exodus, Admit it, we knew some kind of bitter, hard bondage, oppression, and slavery. And the people that are there now, that's what they're experiencing. And some of them know they're there. Some of them know they're in Egypt, and some of them don't know they're in Egypt, and some of them know and they don't care. And some of them know and they want to leave, but they don't think they can. But I want to say this this morning. Everyone has an Egypt. Everyone has an Egypt. I have an Egypt. You have an Egypt. They have an Egypt. We have an Egypt. And if you think about your time in Egypt, and again, I don't mean the literal country, you will understand what I'm saying. Over time, that land of enchantment, even if it started off great, becomes the land of entrapment. Entrapment. And that may seem like a weird word. It's a legal word. When you entrap someone, you trick them into convicting themselves. Hey, I wonder who in our stores want to convict us, trap us into convicting ourselves. The enemy, the adversary, Satan. It's Satan's job to keep us in Egypt, and Satan wants to keep them in Egypt. Because when people are in Egypt, they don't move. They're entrapped. You know another definition of the word entrapped? It means to be caught, to caught, as in a snare, hopelessly caught, entrapped. You know, another word came to mind when I was unpacking this idea of everybody having an Egypt. The word was entrenchment. That's a military term. You know what it means when you have an entrenchment? It means you're fortified. You're dug in. You're dug in. It's all you know. You're ready. And over time, Egypt goes from being this place to being this state of being. It becomes a mindset. It becomes a state of mind. It becomes what the Bible would call a stronghold. And that's what we had when we were in Egypt And that's what they have. And I want to say this to you this morning. Hey, just because we're here and they're not, that doesn't make us better than them. The presence of God and the Holy Spirit in us doesn't make us better than them. It makes us better than us. But Egypt's come in all different shapes and sizes. Strongholds come in all different shapes and forms. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible about what I think is living in the land of entrapment, being entrenched in a mindset, is the story of the rich young ruler. Now, in my version, the rich young ruler is named Skip Skippington. Hi, Jesus, Skip Skippington. Hi, I'm a senior partner in Dewey Cheatham and Howe. Good to meet you, Jesus. Hey, disciples, park the beamer, watch the paint. It's a seven series. I see the rich young ruler as that. He doesn't even know that he's entrenched in this mindset. And then he says to Jesus, he asked the question, and Jesus is a lot kinder than I am when someone asks a stupid question. My Jesus, how do I get this thing called eternal life? If it would have been me, I'd say, well, let me tell you, skip. I'd pop my P for emphasis. Skip. I like to do that. But Jesus doesn't do that because God has compassion. Jesus has compassion for people that are in Egypt. And thank goodness God had compassion when we were in Egypt. But Jesus begins to unpack the commandments, and and then Skip answers, well, listen, if you look in Luke 18, 18, he says, all these I've kept since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, well, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And we've all seen faces like we're about to see here. He said, when he heard this, He became very sad. Why? Because he was very wealthy. 
And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus might as well have said, It'd be easier to shove a camel through the head of a needle than to get some people out of Egypt. And those some people used to be me, and they might have used to be you. And those some people are the people who are not here. They're not here. And you know, when you talk to people who are there and don't know they're there, they take on what I call the Egypt identity. Maybe you'll understand this. They become Egypt. They get like my relatives when you talk about poverty and double wide. They're dug into the idea. Here's what they say. Well, hey, man, I was born in Egypt. My daddy was born in Egypt. He died in Egypt. And by golly, that's where I'm going to die in Egypt. We put the E in Egypt. They put on their Facebook, we are Egypt. That's what we are. That's what we've always been. And we laugh at that. But you unpack that a little further. You'll know what I'm talking about. You go up to people in Egypt, you say, hey, how you doing? Okay. What's going on here? My dad was an alcoholic, and I'm an alcoholic, and his dad was an alcoholic. That's what we are. We're, we're alcoholics. When you walk up to someone and she says, yeah. My mom was married five times. That's why I'm a train wreck. That's why I don't have relationships. That's why I take hostages. I'm afraid nobody's going to want me. I've never had a good relationship. Everyone leaves. I'm alone, and I'm always going to be alone. Or maybe, maybe that Egypt identity becomes what my Egypt identity was. When an art teacher said to me in sixth grade, you know what I see when I see you? I see the biggest waste of breath in this town, the biggest waste of breath in Thurmont, Maryland. You know what else I see? The biggest waste of breath that ever lived in the state of Maryland. You know what you might be? The biggest waste of breath that ever walked the face of the earth. And you can say, well, I'm going to take that on as a badge of honor. But over time, when all you know is oppression and slavery and bondage, your identity is no longer a badge of honor. It's your identity. And you may try like I did to fight against what you don't want to believe, but you don't believe you are ever leaving Egypt. You are hopelessly entrapped, entrenched in Egypt. You don't think there's any way out. And there's no convincing people who are like that without the help of Almighty God, without the grace of Almighty God, without the power of God behind you that they can ever leave Egypt. You know, I was watching TV with my cats the other day. I know some of y'all are dog people. I used to be a dog person too, but I don't live in a place where a dog's very friendly. It's not a good environment. You know, you got you to be there for a dog and Cats are kind of like plants that move. Put a little water out. They just kind of keep growing, you know? <laughs> and the cats and I, we like to watch television together. We like animal shows. I got these two little flat-faced cats. Look like somebody hit them in the face with a pan. They got great big heads, great big eyes. Look like Garfield. One of them's hurry, looks furry, looks more like a goat than a cat. And the other one, he's short hair. They're, they're called exotics. They're a cross between a Persian and a short hair. These cats are smart. They love television. and We love animal shows. We watch a lot of pet TV, and we like Nat Geo. We used to like Animal Planet, but there ain't no animals on Animal Planet anymore. Animal Planet's gotten like MTV. There's no music on MTV, and there's no animals on Animal Planet. And I don't mean to go down a wormhole this morning, but I don't want to watch a show with a guy with big teeth catching a supposed river monster that never exists. It's always a big catfish that he never catches. I don't want to watch a show about a guy putting in a fish tank. That's not entertaining to me, even if he sounds like he's from New York. And I really don't care about finding Bigfoot. I don't care if you find Littlefoot. That's a myth. Bigfoot don't exist. No one's ever even found so much as a carcass. And that guy with the long dyed hair and the baseball hat, he looks like a roadie in my old band. He ain't going to find Bigfoot. He's just acting like a fool out in the woods. And I'm really down a wormhole right now. Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, down the wormhole. <laughs> but the cats and I were watching a show, and the show was about how they train elephants. You know how they train an elephant to stand still? It's really quite sad. They take a chain, and they tie it around a little baby elephant's foot, and they attach it to a spike that they drive way down in the ground. 
And for a period of time, the little baby elephant tries to pull away like this, but he can't pull away because he's not big enough. And over time, you know what happens? He just quits trying. And even when the elephant grows to be one of God's largest and most powerful creations, the elephant just stays in the same place. And you know why? Because he believes he can't move. All you would have to do was take one step and he would be home free. And you guys have seen those YouTube videos where every once in a while the elephant realizes, hey, he ain't got me tied up. I'm gone. Boom. And that makes a great sort of five minutes because the elephant can wreck a town worse than a feral hog. The elephant can flat tear a town down in two seconds. But for the most part, elephants just stand there. They don't move. They just stand there. And there was a time when I was that elephant and maybe there was a time when you were that elephant. And right now, there are people who are not here, and they're just like that elephant. They're not moving because they don't believe they can. And you go up and you try to talk to them about freedom. You try to talk to them, they just look at you like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's why the Israelites were complaining when they were out there in the wilderness. I think sometimes we're too hard on the Israelites. You spend 431 years as a slave, it'll do something to the landscape, not only on the outside, but on the inside of a person. A person begins to believe this is all I am. And there was a time when I was in Egypt that I believed this is all I am and this is all I'm ever be. And what you want to do, you want to walk up to the people in Egypt and you want to shake them. You want to say, let me tell you something. Freedom is not walking like an Egyptian and pretending to be an Egyptian in Egypt. You are called to run like an Israelite through your wilderness, to your promised land, to everything that God has for you. You just want to shake them. Say, come on, move. I know you're scared, but move anyway. I know you feel trapped, but you need to move anyway. Move anyway. You need my dad to go in there and move them anyway. But even if you say that, if you'd have said that to me when I was in Egypt, I would say, why is this crazy guy with the moldy hair yelling at me? What's going on? I don't know how to move. I'm like an elephant. After a while, they don't even have to put the chain on the elephant. They just tie a rope around there. If the elephant just feels something touching his leg, it, it doesn't move. And that's the way I was. And I think maybe some of you relate to that because that's the way you were. One of the words I would use, you, you feel trapped. You feel caught. You feel entrenched. You've resolved. You've resigned to the fact that this is all I will ever, ever be. But remember I said you're here. You're here. I'm here. And we might not be all the way there, but we have each other. And this week you might have gone to a small group. We have them all over the city, hundreds of people in small groups all over the city. And you went there. And maybe for the first time, you said these words. I've never told anybody this before, but I just feel like this is something I can share with you, and I just feel like God wants me to, like, unburden myself from this. And you shared, and you shared for the very first time. And you let that wall down, and that mask fell off, and you understood what it means to be truly free. Maybe not all the way free, but a little freer than you were. You took another step out of Egypt. I know it's hard to leave Egypt behind. Listen. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt in one day, but it took 40 years to get the Egypt out of the Israelites. You can close the door on your past in one day, but there are times when we all go home. There are times when your past will creep up into your present, but you're on the way. You're walking, and when you walk and when you change the way you see things, what happens is you get what I call a different perspective. And Maybe you're like me. Maybe as you walk this week, you realized Egypt is on the edge. Egypt's right there on the edge. See, people who are stuck in Egypt, all they know is Egypt. You know, I lived in Baltimore for 12 years of my life, and they used to have these peddlers come around. And Baltimore is not the funnest city to live in. I just want to say that. I don't want to say anything. I loved living there. But it was like when I lived there, people said, what was it like? I said, I ran track even though I didn't want to. All the time, running, 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 because things were always going down. And they used to have these peddlers that came through our neighborhood. And there were these ponies. And they would pull these little carts. And the ponies were so old, and they were so sad. And they didn't just put blinders on them. They put blinders on them. And all they could see is this. And they walk like this. That's all they ever saw. That's what it's like when you're in Egypt. That's all you see. You can't see that Egypt is right there on the edge. You say, on the edge of what? I say, breakthrough. 
You know what people in Egypt need to know? How to go from broke down to broke through. But you tell them that, they don't know what you're talking about. What people in Egypt need to hear is what God told Moses to tell the Israelites. They need some hope. They need, they need a little oomph. They need a little smile. They need a little encouragement because they can't see that Egypt is right on the edge of everything that God has for them. Look at God told Moses to tell the Israelites, because I think God gets it. I think God has a heart for his kids in Egypt. He understands when you're there, it's hard to see that there's another way of life, and I think it breaks God's heart. And that's why he said, hey, Moses, therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. People need to hear the promise of God. That's what I love about our church. We want people to hear and know the promise of God. That's why we do the four things that we do here. God wants us to reach people. We want to reach you. God wants us to be connected with his people. We want you connected. God wants to grow you and help you take some steps so you can look back and see that Egypt was right on the edge of everything he had for you. God wants to launch you into your promised land. But when you're in Egypt, you don't have the perspective to be able to understand something like that. And that's the way it was for me. That's the way it was for me. I couldn't see that Egypt was right on the edge. And right before my exodus, I'll tell you, it was not a happy time. On the outside, everything looked great. If you came here to chase that honky-tonk rainbow and live that honky-tonk dream, oh, by golly, thanks to that theologian, Alan Jackson, you would have thought I'm killing it. But I wasn't killing it. It was killing me. It was killing me. And I was a long way past the addiction part of my Egypt. Many, many, many years past that. I was in another part of Egypt. It was hard, and it was empty, and it was lonely, and maybe some of you understand it. It's depression. I don't know if you suffer from depression, but I suffer from depression, and I mean terrible depression, and I'm not talking about the kind of depression where people say, come on, come on, little camper. You can get up. You can do it. Come on, boy. I'm talking about the kind of depression where you lay in bed for days, and you can't move. Your soul hurts, your hair hurts, your feet hurt, your life hurts. You can't move, and you don't want to be there, but you don't know how not to be there. And for me, depression doesn't just stay depressing. Then the anxiety comes in. Then the paranoia comes in. And then I'm like a paranoid, depressed lump on the bathroom floor, and I start thinking thoughts like, you know, the world would be a whole lot better if you weren't in it. And at the end of my Egypt story, I lay there on the floor night after night after night. And my favorite way to lay was half of my body in the bathroom and half of my body in the, the, the bedroom. I tell you that because I think I was on the threshold and I didn't know it. I could have gone one way. I could have gone the other way. And I would lay there and I would think all kinds of crazy thoughts. And I was not a believer then. I was anything but a believer. And I would lay there and think, man, you've tried everything. You went to see a shrink. You bought him a boat. And it ain't working. You can't get up off the floor. You've taken the medication. It's made things worse. You... you, you You've tried to, to motivate yourself. You've tried to exercise. You've tried to be gluten-free. You've tried everything, and you're anything but free. I just laid there, and it was on one of those nights, and I remembered. Do you know how I remembered this recently? Because we've been filming these videos of life change. We've been filming these stories of people whose life has gone one way. They're in Egypt. You saw them right here at the beginning. But then something happens. I had the privilege of being able to be there when we were filming them. And as I watched that, when they would tell their stories, I would just sob like a baby. And all kinds of memories would come back to me about that time. And there are a series of things that led me out of that. 
But there was one in particular that stuck out for me recently. And I don't know the details. But when you're stuck like that and you don't want to see anybody and you haven't taken a bath for about a week, the highlight of your day is walking out to the mailbox to get your mail. And you wait till everybody's gone to do that because you don't want anybody to see you. You feel like you're the scourge of the earth. And one day I walked out to my mailbox, and I'll never forget it. I got a card in the mailbox from a church that's right down the road here. And on the front of this little two-cent postcard was a picture of a friend of mine who I used to be in the music business with who was the worship pastor of that church. Big smile on his face. And as I walked in the door that day, I remember thinking, you know, you've tried everything else. You've done this and you've done that. Maybe you ought to go to church. Maybe you ought to try this thing that this guy's doing. It seems to be working for him. I know you don't want to do it. And one night I laid on the floor. A few nights later, I prayed the Lord's Prayer to the best of my ability. And I got up. And in an 8.15 service on a Sunday morning, I walked in a church like this, and I sat in the very back, and something inside me changed. It changed. Remember I said, you're here. And I was there. And there was here. And I walked in there with a lot of Egypt in me. I walked in there with a lot of broken. I walked in there with a lot of baggage. I always tell people it's hard to be a pastor without a past. All you'll ever be is an oar. <laughs> but me and my past came in there, and I sat in the back, and it was an overnight life change. It takes a long time to get out of Egypt, but it was a step. It was a step that became another step that became another step that became another step that became another step on the journey. And there were times on the journey that I wanted to stop stepping, but I kept walking, I kept walking, I kept believing. God, I don't think I'm the guy, but I kept going. God, if you say I'm the guy, I'm going to keep going. And I kept going. And as I was preparing for this message, I prayed, God, what do you want me to tell the people? What do you want me to say? Because this is never easy for me. I would never tell you that one day in my life I thought I'm called to be a preacher. No, I think I'm called to be a pastor. You know what I think I'm good at? I'm good at being a shepherd. I'm good at coming alongside you on your journey. I'm good at walking alongside you. And when you say I'm going through this or I've been through this, I'm good at saying me too. And I'm good about helping you connect in relationships. And I'm good about helping you take next steps. But I've never once looked in the mirror and thought, you could be the old Pastor Stephen Furtick. Never once thought that. For me, preparing a message is like passing a kidney stone. It's hard. And I lay there and cry and scream and lay, oh, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to see? I stare at the text. I got to get my heavy-duty glasses on. These are my designer glasses. I got to get the old Coke bottles out and go, what do you want me to see, God? And the other day I was in my office, and I love a whiteboard. I love to whiteboard everything. I whiteboard everything. I'm like this. That's what I do. That's how I prepare a message. I love to tell you there's some scientific formula. I'm a whiteboard guy. I used to be pen and paper, but I can't read my own writing anymore. So I can write it when I write it in big red ink, and even then it's questionable. <laughs> Looks a lot like Egypt. <laughs> Hieroglyphics. <laughs> but somewhere in the middle of that, I began to see something. Pastor J.D. and I were in there. You know, we got a great pastor. He's an unbelievable pastor, and he's my friend, and I love him, and I'm honored any time that I get to do anything in this church. And I'll tell you, when he asked me to be on staff here, it was one of the life-changing moments of my life. It really was, and I'll never forget that. But he and I like to unpack Scripture. We're in there unpacking Scripture. We like to get into it. We love it. We look at Scripture like we're working on a hot rod. We're up there. What if he said this? What do you think God's saying here? And we were doing that. We were unpacking it, and I started seeing it. I started asking myself, God, what do you want me to see? And then I saw it. I saw it. I want to read it to you. I want to see if you see it. Remember, we're here, and I want us to think about the people who aren't here I want you to see if you see it here in Exodus 3. God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, 
here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. So now go. Go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I saw it. I saw it. You know what it is? The burning bush. The burning bush. You know what the burning bush is an Old Testament equivalent of? Something you and I see every single day of our lives. You get on an airplane, they say, hey, I want to call your attention to it over the wings. There's also one at the front and the back of the plane. You go to the movies this afternoon. They're going to say, I want to call your attention to it. In the back of the theater, there's one right back here in the back of the theater. It hangs over every door and every building you walk through. Because you know what the burning bush is an Old Testament equivalent to? An exit sign. And you know what Moses was? An invitation. Moses was God's bearded invitation with sandals and a staff to the Israelites to exit Egypt. An invitation is often an exit. An invitation is an exit. A card in the mail, an invitation is an exit. An invitation is personal. When someone invites you to something, it's special. When someone asks you out on a date, it's special. When someone sends you an invite to the CMA Awards, it's special. When someone invites you to a a wedding, it's special. An invitation is personal. And an invitation is often an exit. You know who Moses is the forerunner to in the Old Testament? Jesus. Jesus. You know who the Israelites are forerunners to in the Old Testament? Another people that God wants to lead out of Egypt. You know who they are? Me, you, them, us. You know what Jesus was? Jesus was God's invitation. And God didn't send Jesus in an envelope. He sent him to earth wrapped in swaddling clothes and he laid him in a manger. But he was our invitation out of bondage, our invitation out of sin. He was our invitation to our promised land. Jesus is our promised land. And can I tell you something that bothers me? What really bothers me about the modern church, about us? We've been taught you leave Egypt and you never go back. Don't ever go back. We've been taught you drive right past the Egypt exit. I don't want to be a church like that. I don't want to be a church that looks at the people who aren't there and says, we got ours. Guess you're going to have to find it on your own. That's not what Moses did. That's not what God did. That's not what Jesus did. God is an invitational God, and he wants us to invite everyone out of Egypt. He wants them to be invited to an exit. You know what you're called to be? You're called to be the Moses in their Exodus story. I don't know what's keeping them in Egypt, but you're called to walk up to whatever form of Pharaoh is oppressing them, and you're called to say, hey, Pharaoh, let my brother go. You're called to walk up and say, hey, Pharaoh, let my sister go. You're called up to say, let my people go. You are the invitation to their exit out of Egypt, and I believe their life change is worth our sacrifice. And you know why I believe that? because it was worth it to somebody else to sacrifice so I could be here. So this guy who shouldn't even be walking the face of the earth could stand up and say, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. You can leave Egypt today. It might not be easy, but you can leave Egypt today. An invitation is an exit. It's an exit. And I want to get real practical this morning. I mean super practical, like er, elementary schoolhouse rock practical. Here's what I want you to do today. I want you to be someone's invitation to an exit. And when you walk out there in that lobby, there are going to be stacks 
of invite cards on the table. And I want you to pick them up. I want you to put them in your pocket. I want you to put them in your purses. I want you to carry them around. And I want you to invite some people out of their Egypt into everything that you have experienced here. I want you to invite them to Easter. I want you to do it. And I'm telling you why you should do it. Statistics are on your side. I love statistics. I'm a baseball guy. Today I feel like the old pitcher they brought out of the bullpen. You got any gas left in the arm? Not much. Good thing for you. <laughs> I want you to invite some people to come to church. Statistically, TomRainer.com says 82% of the people we invite will come to church. Gallup, secular poll, says 6 out of 10 Americans right now are making plans to come to church on Easter would it look like if you brought them here? Because I'm going to give you another staggering statistic. Only 2% of us ever invite someone to come to church with us. 2%. I thought it would at least be five. We'll invite them to the Preds game. We'll invite them to dinner. We'll invite them to the movies. We'll invite them out on a date. We'll invite them to come see the kids. We'll invite them to come on vacation. We'll invite them to birthday parties. We'll invite them to Easter dinner. But it's hard to invite people to church. That's because the enemy doesn't want people coming out of Egypt. It's the enemy's job to keep people in bondage. I don't want to see people in bondage. I hate seeing people in Egypt. I want to see everyone sitting in a chair like you and like me. I want to see them here. This is God's plan for us. And next week, we're going to have water baptisms, and I want to invite you to come take that step with us. I've seen hands all across the auditorium over the last couple of months. The Bible says the next step upon receiving salvation is water baptism. I want to see you take that step. Come get baptized with us. And then I want to invite you today right after this service. Come take some next steps with us. We offer two every week. You ask, what's a good week to take some next steps this week? We offer two of them. Do I think they're the forever marathon that you're going to be running? No, but I think they're the first two steps on the journey that can lead to everything you're looking for. One's called Discover Hills. It's all about being a member of our church. It's all about what we're all about. And the other's called Discover Purpose. And we're going to take some personality tests. We're going to help you unpack how God made you. And it'll be our honor to help you figure out your purpose because we believe you were created on purpose for a purpose. And we would love to help you discover what that is today. And I'll give you a good reason to come. We're going to serve you lunch. Have lunch. Come on, have lunch with us. I'll be in there. We'll laugh. We'll we'll have a good time. We'll have lunch and we'll take a journey together. And then for some of you here today, the first two steps on your journey begin with two words. And those two words are, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you a question today. Is today the day you take those two steps out of Jesus that begins with, yes, Jesus? Is today the day you take that step on your journey? Because if you do, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you that question. And then I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to pray with you. I'm going to pray with you, and the prayer will be my prayer, but the words will become your words because you're praying it. So if that's you today, and today's the day you want to take those steps out of Egypt towards everything that Jesus has for you, on the count of three, is today the day you let Jesus be the Lord and Savior of life? On the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Yes, I see you. I see you. You can put your hands down now. Just pray with me where you are. Dear Jesus, I've been living my life my own way, but now I want to live my life for you. I've been doing some things wrong. I've made some mistakes. But today, I want to change everything. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I realized today that not even on my best day was I good enough. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. And I believe that you rose again to give me new life. And today, I want new life. Jesus, come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus, come into my heart and change everything forever. Jesus, help me understand your amazing grace, your unending mercy and your unconditional love in your holy, amazing name.
Amen. Hey, church, can we celebrate the people who just gave their life to Jesus this morning? Come on, let's give it up. Let's give it up.